the name of God. Amen. Amen. So this is the Sunday after the Ascension, or it's seventh Sunday of Easter. Ascension always occurs 40 days after Easter, which means that Ascension is always on a Thursday. But because we don't tend to worship on Thursdays, we like to transfer it to the following Sunday. I have to say, though, that for the longest time, I pretty much ignored the Ascension. And that changed about five years ago. And uh, so I want to talk about the Ascension, but first I want to share with you this I wish, sometimes I wish I could just, you know, really quickly show you a picture. But I can't, so I've got to try to, the best I can to describe it. There's, this cartoon has been making its way around Facebook about the Ascension. And it's, a, it's sort of a classic image of the Ascension. Jesus on a cloud, uh, rising up. And uh, coming down from the cloud are these yellow rays uh, I imagine sort of like a, an Apollo rocket, uh, Jesus uh, taking this vertical takeoff. And uh, above it, it says, after his resurrection, <clears throat> Jesus appeared to his disciples and many others before ascending into heaven. And then down below are all these people, but one guy is saying, where? Where? I don't see him. And there's this big arrow pointing to this guy, and inside the arrow it says, Ascension Deficit Disorder. <laughs> so it, it's funny in that sense, but I also wanted to share it with you because of the image that it gives us about the Ascension, and it's, it's a classic one. And it has contributed to a great deal of misunderstanding about the Ascension. And like I said, about, about five years ago, I really came to appreciate the importance of the Ascension to uh, an overall balanced view of our Christianity. Uh, that it is the follow-up to uh, the sermon that I gave on Easter morning uh, where I said, remember I said that the resurrection, the word resurrection means only one thing. There isn't any other kind of resurrection except bodily life after death. In the biblical vocabulary, the writers of the Gospels chose that word, used that word, because that's what it meant. They had other things, other words they could have chosen if, if something spiritual had happened that wasn't physical. But no, they chose this word, resurrection. And so this is the follow-up to that. So what I want to do is I'm going to talk about some things that contribute to misunderstanding about the ascension. I want to talk about what happens or what might happen if we get our thinking about the ascension wrong and then end with, well, what happens if we get it right? So let's start with common sources of misunderstanding. And, and the first point of misunderstanding is the language itself. The word ascension, ascend, of course, leaves us with this image assisted in no small part by the artwork of the Middle Ages of this, you know, Jesus taking, like I said, this vertical takeoff uh, up into uh, the sky. Uh, and, and in that sense, <clears throat> in our own day and age, excuse me, <clears throat> in, in our own day and age, the ascension suffers or can suffer from a problem that is similar to the second coming, where it's either completely literal or it's just completely metaphorical. It's literal or the skeptical view of the ascension. We do the same thing with the second coming. <clears throat> and so when it comes to <clears throat> excuse me when it comes to uh, the second coming that can be a literal kind of thing which has gone down all kinds of roads thanks to authors like Tim LaHaye and the, you know, the Left Behind series got a whole lot of mileage out of that 
uh, in those books. And on the other hand, the second coming simply can be a way of talking about something spiritual that will happen someday when the spirit of God will permeate all things. And again, leaving completely to the wayside anything having to do with this physical world that we live in. And it's similar with the ascension, that the, the word itself can either become ov overly literal, where we get this sort of literal trajectory into the skies, or it can be completely metaphorical and can become nothing more than language that is saying that Jesus stopped being physical and went back to being spiritual. So there's the language problem. Second uh, point of misunderstanding is cosmology. Now that's just a word that means the way to see reality. And there is a biblical cosmology that flies in the face of the way we as 21st century people tend to see the world and to see reality. So let's back up. The Christians, early Christians and first century Jews, their first century Jewish counterparts, uh, unlike uh, what we may think, were not particularly locked into a uh, image of the world or the cosmos in, as the sort of triple decker thing where you've got heaven above and hell down here and earth in between. They, they weren't locked into that kind of thinking. And when they spoke about up and down, they were using that kind of language often as a metaphor. Uh, and like our own metaphors, they don't need explaining. You, know, you don't need to say to someone what it means when you say Fred is moving up the ladder. Okay, you don't have to explain that career advancement doesn't have anything to do with actually climbing a ladder. And it's the same in the New Testament when they talk about up and the clouds and all of that. They're talking about metaphorical things. They're not saying that heaven is up there as if that's what they actually thought. Heaven is actually something that they believed was really quite near to them. In fact, may, in one sense, all around them at, at one sense, but heaven was still completely different from this world. There are two points to make about heaven in the biblical cosmology. The first is that heaven relates to earth in the Bib or, or the cosmos in the biblical cosmology tangentially, such that the one who is in heaven is now accessible everywhere and anywhere in this world all, all at once. I tried to draw this, uh, I drew a circle. So I, 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 this ended up confusing people, so if it confuses you, I'm sorry. But I, I drew a circle, and instead of imagining the circle as earth, imagine that on the top is earth and the, this physical world, and heaven is in the middle. And once you put Jesus there, you can see that he's now instantly accessible anywhere. In that, it's, it's, a, it's a flawed, it's not a perfect image, but it's as close as I can get to what the first century writers were trying to say about heaven. So that's the first thing, that it relates tangentially to earth. The second thing to say is that in the biblical cosmology, heaven is mission control. Heaven is where God rules uh, everything, heaven and earth. And this leads me to say plainly, if you haven't figured it out already, that we have to hold in our minds from this point forward in this sermon that what the ascension is saying is that Jesus of Nazareth the one who was raised bodily from the dead is now reigning as Lord bodily in heaven. And that's where I usually see a lot of deer in headlights kind of looks. I'll come back to that. The, the third area of misunderstanding is theology. It comes as a shock to people to hear what I've just said that somehow the majority of people in, in this country, whether they've ever heard of Plato or not, 
are nevertheless imprisoned by Plato's conception of the spiritual as non-physical. And that's Plato, it's not the Bible. Despite a lot of hymns and prayers that suggested over the centuries to the contrary, there is in fact a long tradition in Christian orthodoxy that the heaven is not this immaterial place, but in fact a very physical place. And this means, among other things, that the ascension invites us to rethink our whole understanding of theology and take it out of the clouds and bring it back down to terra firma where it belongs. What we're encouraged to grasp is that though they're very different, heaven and earth are not all that far apart. Heaven is certainly not a way of talking about our spiritual life after death, although there is a spiritual life, don't get me wrong, but that's not the end of it. That's not all that there is. So, those are the points of misunderstanding. So what happens then when this misunderstanding then leads us to thinking about the ascension in the wrong way? In a way where ascension is really nothing more than language about how Jesus stopped being physical and went back to being spiritual or stopped being mortal and human and went back to being God. What happens when, that, when you do that? I'm calling it, you get the spiritualization of our faith. Now, I hope and intend for that to sound strange uh, because I want it to jar our attention a little bit. That it is, in fact, though, what goes wrong when we get the ascension wrong. And spiritualization is this, that language about Jesus gets reduced to language about his presence in us through the Spirit and that's all there is to Jesus' presence, that he is in us through the Spirit. The Lord who dwells in us through the Spirit quickly becomes a way then for me to excuse or explain away the choices that I make about my life that may or may not be part of God's plan. Uh, it, I haven't noticed this so much lately, but there was a period of time certainly in the, the first decade of the 21st century, where there were colleagues of mine that constantly talked about the Christ in me and the Christ in you. And when the more I listened to that language, the more I began to wonder whether the Christ that they were talking about had anything to do with Jesus of Nazareth. That it, it seemed to be a language saying, well, this is who I want my God to be. And so I'm a, I'll call this, my, this conception of God the Christ. And then that makes it okay. That's what you get when you have nothing more than a spiritual conception of Jesus. You get the sort of hallmark hall of fame God or the greeting card. And that dates me, I know. The, the greeting card. What's the uh, internet equivalent of the greeting cards? E-cards? E-card. You know, it's the kind of thing where you get a pithy little saying inside the card that is never going to challenge you. It's always going to affirm you where you are. It's never going to challenge you to something more. And it ends up producing, or at least it can produce, spiritual flabbiness. You don't know this, but in 2002, I had what I thought was a heart attack. It wasn't a heart attack, but Carolyn rushed me to the hospital. She came to get me in my office, and I was there in the emergency room, and the, the nurse, which I thought this was, this was very unprofessional, she gasped when she took my blood pressure. And, <laughs> you know, and I, don't, I can't explain why what happened next got me to sort of converted me, but I, I saw my doctor in a follow-up visit and he said, well, Ben, how long do you want to live? So I came home and I said to Carolyn, I'm going to change my life. <clears throat> and she said, yes, dear. <laughs> but it didn't take long for her to figure out that I really did mean it, and I lost 70 pounds between 2002 and 2003. Now, 
The bad news is, is that starting in 2007 with a broken collarbone and then in 2008 with a major back surgery uh, and, you know, whatever excuse I can come up with, I've gained, between, depending on what day of the week you talk to me, I've gained 15 to 20 pounds of that back. But my point is this. People who knew me when I was heavy and had not been with me during this transformation, when they saw me, they were shocked. Some didn't recognize me. But all of them asked, I mean, without exception, all of them asked, how did you do it? And what do you think I said? I took a pill. No, that's what they wanted to hear. I think, you know, we all know the answer, right? It's diet and exercise. There is no other answer. I don't know why we ask the question except that we hope against hope that there, there's some easy way. And what's true about our physical life is true in our spiritual lives. We want everything to be easy. We want an easygoing spirituality. And that's what you get when you have a Jesus whose only presence and concept of presence in our, our lives is in us, living in us through the Holy Spirit, and we have no conception of Jesus, the Jesus who lives apart from us, outside of us, over and above us as Lord. As Lord reigning from the control room. How many of you are, have heard of Christ the King Sunday? Has anyone here heard of Christ the King Sunday? Okay, quite a few more than, than the eight o'clock, and I'm glad that many of you have not, because the Christ the King Sunday occurs on the last Sunday of the season after Pentecost, or for those of you not quite sure when that is, it's the Sunday just before the first Sunday of Advent. And that's been, for the longest time, it's been creeping into Episcopalian sort of consciousness that that is Christ the King Sunday, and that is wrong. It is wrong. Today is Christ the King Sunday. Notice the, the hymns that we're singing. Notice the prayer for today that begins, God, O King of glory. Why? Because Jesus has ascended to the mission control room, to the throne room, where he now rules as man on the throne over us, other than us, different from us, separate from us, and yes, also present to us in the spirit in our lives. When we begin to conceptualize God and Jesus that way, now we're moving towards a correct understanding of the ascension. And it gets us away from trying, hoping against hope that we can have a spirituality that's easy. Dallas Willard recently died. He, he is, was one of America's great theologians, in my opinion. He wrote a lot of books. He, his most popular, uh, The Divine Conspiracy, Hearing God, Spirit of the Disciplines. When he died, I went looking for, uh, I wanted some quotes. I wanted to say something on my, on my Facebook page that I thought captured Dallas Willard and the kind of theologian he was and the message that he had. And I found this. It's from a book that I've not written. Uh, uh, it's not, I've not read. It's, the book is called The Great Omission, and this is what he wrote. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude, effort is an action, and it is well-directed, decisive, and sustained effort that is the key to the keys of the kingdom and the life of restful power in ministry and life that those keys open to us. So what happens when we get the ascension right? Well, we get Christ the King, first of all. When we firmly grasp that Jesus is not the Christ in me and the Christ in you, but the Christ who also lives above and over us as Lord, when we, in fact, begin to grasp what the ascension is all about, 
This Jesus who is, yes, strangely present to us in the spirit, but is also strangely absent other than and different from us. What we get is the Jesus who is the Lord of your life who is the Lord, who might very well say, and may in fact be saying, this part of your life I want you to change. This part of your life is deadly. Listen to me, I am your Lord. But as long as it's the Christ in me, I can say, well that doesn't sound like the Christ in me. So I'll just ignore that. Now, the second good thing about the ascension, when we get it right, is first of all, we are beginning to get a glimpse of where history is headed. Okay? Because Revelation 21 and 22, heaven and earth are going to be united. Heaven and earth are going to be remade. It's abundantly clear from Paul that the, the eternal life that he envisions for us as a result of the resurrection of Jesus is not a disembodied one, but an embodied one. And so if this is all headed towards a place or a time when heaven and earth will be united and there will be this physical place where death cannot touch, what we see in the resurrected Jesus living as, as it were, perfectly at home in heaven and living there as Lord is we are seeing in him the uniting of heaven and earth. The uniting that all of salvation history is headed towards. We get a better understanding of the Trinity the Trinity is exactly a way of seeing and rejoicing in the human Jesus of Nazareth who is still yet distinct from the Father and the Spirit. That's not what you get when you see the resurrection and ascension as a simply a way of saying that Jesus went back to being God. The sacrament of Eucharist I mean, this seems to me vital, vitally important. I even mentioned this to the eight o'clock, although I have, to, I have to be assure them that I have no plans on changing where the Eucharist is celebrated, but I have to tell you that this is where the Eucharist needs to be celebrated so that you can see it. Because what we're watching, of course, is something physical, bread and wine that somehow this Jesus that we worship who is present to us in the spirit is yet still outside of us, inviting us and summoning us to come forward to a new way of life who when we consume it, yes, we are empowered spiritually by it. But it is a powerful reminder of the physicalness of the spiritual life. The ascension is mysterious, to say the least. And I dare say it even summons us to, de to think what we might believe is the unthinkable. That somehow Jesus could live there, be at home there, and that that image is not some sort of category mistake. But it is in fact the way things really are. And, I, you know, I'm not the first person to come up with this idea. As a matter of fact, this isn't my idea at all. C.S. Lewis imagined just the kind of thing that I'm telling you in his, the, the Chronicle, this, the, the Chronicles of Narnia. He saw and imagined two worlds that were separate and yet somehow related and linked and interlocked with each other. And though those were children's books, the concept isn't concept is very much part of Christian orthodoxy. We're encouraged to see that heaven and earth, though different, is not all that far away. It's not up there. But somehow Jesus is accessible to us everywhere because he reigns as Lord. The Jesus of Nazareth reigns as Lord from there. And whatever else we say about it, it's certainly not 
the ascension is not simply language for talking about how everything about where we're headed is spiritual. It is a powerful, powerful feast in the church reminding us of where salvation history is headed. And as I've said in Easter, and I'll leave you with this, thanks be to God, because I don't know about you, but a disembodied eternity strikes me as incredibly boring. Amen.